Hello, it is February 5th, 2016. I wanted to do a video with updates on the egg harvesting and cryopreservation um, process that I started, that I made a video about back November 1st. Um, so kind of since then, I had my consultation or second consultation, I guess, with my um, specialist on November 18th. Um, and basically at that time he goes over the informed consent to really kind of talk about all of, you know, the medications I'll be taking, answer any questions. Um, so did that. And then he also, um, was doing a little bit of like genetic testing counseling. So just based on like my heritage and whatnot, like whether or not I wanted to do any type of, um, tests for recessive alleles for common, um, genetic conditions. So in my case, um, it was uh, spinal muscular atrophy and cystic fibrosis. Um, so talked with him, signed the consents, also um, had an opportunity to sit down with their um, financial advisor person just to, I really, really wanted to clarify exactly like what I would expect to be covered and what wouldn't be covered. And come to find out, I'm actually the first person at their office to be covered under this new policy, like specifically for trans individuals. So it was a little bit of a learning process on all of our ends. Um, and luckily she's been really great through the whole process as well as like I have a contact at my insurance company who's been really helpful. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about that too. Um, but, and then also that day did some baseline blood work. So this was more so around like not necessarily, um, levels pertaining to like a cycle, like luteinizing hormone or anything like that. This was like vitamin D and prolactin and some other, um, you know, natural hormones or, or vitamins or whatever in the body that um, affect fertility. And then also had a test for hep B and I'm trying to remember what else that, at that time. Um, but so had those levels checked um, and then got to sit down with um, a uh, his team nurse to really kind of go over like the flow chart of what would be expected during like during the actual stimulation process. Um, I had decided already that I wasn't going to do December because I expected to go home for Christmas. I didn't end up going home, so I could have, um, but I didn't do that. Um, and then when I was leaving, basically I was advised at the start of my next cycle, so in December, to just give them a call on the on the first day, and then on the second day go in and have um, blood work done, so checking hormone levels, so that one more specific hormone levels, also had prolactin tests again, and then also to do a pelvic ultrasound. And with that, they're basically looking at um, each of the ovaries to see how many follicles I have had in each ovary, basically. And so did that in December. Um, and I had 11, 11 follicles. Um, <laughs> I don't know whether that's good or bad. They didn't say either way. Um, but then uh, the other blood work as well. Um, ended up having... Um, elevated prolactin levels twice in a row and their normal protocol for that is like once that happens go to an MRI just to check pituitary gland to see if there's any reason uh, like any like possible lesion on the pituitary gland or something of why it would be secreting more prolactin. Um, so you know they advise it do that and because this was based off of like abnormal blood work it was also covered by insurance. Um, so I had that done December 29th, and it came back totally normal. Um, I'm actually, funny enough, I was just researching this. Um, I think the elevated prolactin was because I ate too much cheese the night before the blood draw. Like, I stopped eating at 10 o'clock like I was supposed to, but I had I had a lot of cheese that night. I was at a party at a friend's, and there was a table of cheese, and that's, like, all I did. Um, and so I'm pretty sure that contributed to that. So I won't be doing that again. Um, uh, no more cheese. Ish. Um, so did that in December and was expecting to kind of do the stimulation process and harvest in January. But uh, there was a little bit of an insurance snag, which I, I would have been shocked had I got through this whole process without any type of issue with, with insurance. Um, and basically insurance, they submitted for a prior authorization after I did like that baseline blood work ultrasound um, for the stimulate for one cycle of stimulation, which is basically um, all of the all of the hormones related to that, all the fertility drugs and like one egg harvesting. So that would be considered one cycle. Um, so they submitted a prior authorization um, 
to, to the insurance company, and I have Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts, um, to okay this, insurance came back and denied. Um, and their uh, basis of denial was because under this policy, like I, I would have had to specifically meet the criteria um, of gender dysphoria. And I actually had no documentation in my patient charts anywhere of, of gender dysphoria. Um, and so what ended up having to happen um, was my uh, primary care provider had to call Blue Cross and do uh, what's called a provider appeal um, and basically just appeal to the insurance company as to why I am eligible for this service um, and that my and that my transitioning or my basically you know hormones related tra to transition do negatively impact my um, fertility and that's why like I should be eligible for the service so he had to call and do that it was a little bit interesting to navigate just because I hadn't had that diagnosis in my chart at, at any point yet also because I came to him for like routine continuation of care my hormones and everything were initiated back in Reno so he wasn't the one who actually like put the diagnosis in the chart so just anyways it was just a little bit complicated um, so he had to call and do that um, which he did uh, unfortunately it was like two days late in January because um, I started uh, my period and then it, the um, notice of reversal of decision came two days later so I was like damn it um, so I ended up having to wait till January so that's or wait till February so that's why now I'm here at this point um, so January nothing happened um, and um, February now I started my period today um, and so now this process begins um, it's been uh, uh, quite an interesting um, process just because like I didn't anticipate it going out until February and I already had some travel plans like I'm going home at the end of the month there's potential I'm going down to Peru for work um, in March and I like I have to be here once I start like the cycle I have to be here um, so I called today day w one um, go in tomorrow again for more blood work and another ultrasound yay um, and tomorrow starts all the drugs. So I got, once all, the prior authorization went through, I got all of the drugs um, approved, and, and so his, uh, my specialist's um, office ordered them all for me, so they are all right here. So four different kinds, all injection, um, all just based on different hormone levels. So this one here is um, gonal F, so this is follicle-stimulating hormone, so it's kind of, the, it's an injection pen which is kind of cool so it comes like preloaded and I just turn it to whatever dose they tell me to put it at I don't know what it's supposed to be yet um, and it's subcutaneous subcutaneous injection um, so I have four of those so I'm going to be taking those um, for about 15 days um, this whole thing should be about 15 days um, just to the point of the ovulation at like peak of ovulation when they would go in and like harvest those eggs um, so I got four of those, um, and so that's just straight follicle stimulating hormone. And then they also send this, which is called Menopure, um, which is just in case this is follicle stimulating hormone as well as luteinizing hormone. Um, so just in case I need that extra boost of luteinizing hormone to help stimulate the eggs or follicles. Um, so basically, the point of both of these is to stimulate more follicle growth in each ovary so like I said I had 11 just with no drugs whatsoever so the goal would to be get me up to like 30 um, and so it's really gonna cause like my ovaries to just like really kind of swell um, and just produce a lot more follicles than what I would do naturally um, so like I said both of these are subcutaneous injection um, and then those this one I'll only need if, if I need luteinizing hormone. The other one for 15 days. And then the other things that I have are, um, this is called cetratide. Um, and again, injection style. This one's kind of cool because you actually have to like mix saline with, or whatever the fluid is, I should figure that out, um, with the powder and actually mix it and then do that injection. Basically what this does is it prevents you from... Um, ovulating too quickly 
So I'm going to have both of these where it's like bo boosting like more and more and more follicles, but this one will actually stop them from being released. Um, it's all quite fascinating, like really. I'm kind of my own science experiment right now, um, although the science has been verified. Um, so really kind of cool. So there's that one. So there are six of those. Um, and then the last thing that I do is, um, and I'm still a little bit unsure of like how many times I do this, but this is called Luprolide or um, Lupron. Um, and so this one is what will like trigger release. And it's very timed. It's very specific. I'm supposed to do it 72 hours prior to harvest. Um, and so I'll do one injection and then blood work and then a following injection and then harvest like 72 hours later. It's very specific. Um, so those are the different medications that I have that I have to do. Um, and then throughout the entire process, um, especially once, um, I think it's like day six or something, like once my period is done, um, like I have to do really frequent monitoring of, of hormone levels. So it's like labs and ultrasound at almost like every one to three days. Um, so that'll be fun. Um, so I'm going to uh, have to start doing that. Um, Cost-wise, I just did the math to see how much all of these drugs were. Like, my, I ended up paying $105 out of pocket um, just in co-pays um, for the different medications. Uh, without insurance, these four different drugs would be a little over $4,700. $4,700 for these drugs on my couch. Um, this... One pen alone is $950. I nearly shat myself. I was like, holy shit. Um, so you want to talk about cost prohibitive for gen general population without the right insurance. Unbelievable. Um, so that's kind of that cost right there. I have started keeping, I don't know why I didn't do this from the beginning. This is what I always do, though. Um, I've started keeping a little bit more of like a log of like all of the different visits that I had, all the different blood work, um, and then costs throughout um, to just kind of see and looking back and then in, in case like other people are interested in this too. Um, so I'm just kind of keeping track of all of that. Um, so that's kind of how it's going at this point. So tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. I have ultrasound and blood work. Um, and then um, every evening between 7 and 9 p.m. I have to do start doing the shots and the drugs. Um, and the, all of the blood work and ultrasound is done in house at the fertility clinic. So like when I go in tomorrow, I'll have a call by like three o'clock that afternoon of what my dosings are going to be. Um, and so they call and instruct you. Um, so they're really responsive in that way. And that's kind of nice. Um, and in general, like working with this facility, um, they've been really great in terms of, uh, gender identity stuff. There was a little bit of awkwardness in December when I went in for my ultrasound and blood work because I checked in and I checked that I was getting an ultrasound and one of the, one of the, um, techs kind of checked the sheet and I was the only person in the waiting room and she checked the sheet and she, I, she kind of like gave me, you know, the side eye, like ultrasound. And then she kind of like was like kind of glancing at me as she walked back into the back and I could hear her whispering with one of the other techs of like, yeah, he's the only person there. Ultrasound is checked. And I was like, oh, fuck, here we go. Um, and then, you know, she comes back out, checks again. And I'm like, yep, it's me. Um, but ended up going and getting blood work and I'm talking with the phlebotomist. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure they're quite confused. <laughs> and she's like, yeah, I'm sure they are. Um, but then another, one of the other, um, radiology techs came and grabbed me and did the ultrasound and she was fabulous. Very nice. Um, so when I was talking with the nurse today in scheduling my appointment, I asked them, uh, to please just send a flag to whoever is, um, working in the morning just to give them a heads up of my gender identity. So that doesn't happen again. Um, and she said she would and apologized that that happened. And it wasn't like anything, there was no like bad outcome. It was just a little awkward and I kind of don't want to deal with that. Um, so well, keep going at that. Um, uh, so I'll probably make a few more updates as this goes. Um, I'm not really sure what to expect and how I'm going to feel, especially on these medications. So we'll see. But um, wanted to at least make that update. So I will hopefully chat with you all soon. Bye.